Okay, welcome back. Uh, this is a session called Writing Textbooks. Is a united narrative of a pluralistic America possible? I'm responsible for this session, my fault. Uh, but I've tried to gather, I mean, this, these are five of the best historians in the United States working in various fields. In fact, uh, how, how in the world do I really introduce all these folks? I'll do it very quickly. Um, Mia Bay is the Nichols Chair in American History at the University of Pennsylvania. She used to be at Rutgers. Uh, she did a PhD here at Yale under David Brian Davis. Um, she had a, a BA at the University of Toronto, Canada. She just recently won the Bancroft Prize, which is an important prize, uh, for Traveling Black, a story of race and resistance. Came out in 2021. Uh, that book also won a prose award, which I know this that's the acronym of an organization, I think, but prose awards. I think that's cool. She's also the author before that of The White Image in the Black Mind, African American Ideas about white people. She wrote a biography of Ida Wells Barnett. Um, and many other things. But me is also the author of a, a co-authored textbook in African American history, broadly defined. Ned Blackhawk, my colleague here at Yale, is the Howard Lamar Professor of History and American Studies at Yale. If any of you don't know Howard Lamar, you should. Um, the great historian of the American West here, created the field. Um, Ned's from Detroit. He doesn't always put that on his bio, but uh, he's a Detroiter um, and a Detroit Tigers fan. He suffers with me. I love the fact that he puts in his bio that he attended uh, McGill University under the auspices of the Jay Treaty of 1794. <laughs> Ned, you can explain that at some point if you want. He's an enrolled member of the Timoak tribe of the Western Shoshone Indians of Nevada. He's the author of uh, his first book of um, the American Great Basin, Violence Over the Land, Indians and Empires in, early, in the Early American West. He's done anthologies of indigenous history, uh, two of them. Um, and he's just completed, and I think it comes out I don't know, any day or any week or 2023 or sometime very soon of the book, The Rediscovery of American Native Peoples and the Unmaking of US History. So a broad history of this thing called the United States through the lens of Native American history. Um, there's a pattern here. Uh, Erica Lee is currently Regents Professor of History and Asian American Studies at the University of Minnesota. She's soon to move to Harvard. Uh, we forgive her for that. <laughs> no. um, she's the current or incoming president of the Organization of American Historians and I owe a lot to Eric because I'm the one that follows her and she's been trying to teach me what I will have to do. So bless her if you can, because that's not easy. Uh, she's the author of, among other works, America for Americans, A History of Xenophobia in America, and most recently, and important for this topic, The Making of Asian America. And she's currently working on the book entitled Made in Asian America, A History, of, a History for Young People, um, with a co-author who's a Newbery Award, Award winner named Christina Sunternat. Uh, Erica is an extremely important citizen in our craft, I must add, in our, our field, our business of doing history. Uh, Paul Ortiz uh, is professor of history and director of the Proctor Oral History Program at the University of Florida. He holds uh, a chair there uh, named for the National Archives. And he runs an oral history program, the Samuel Proctor Oral History Program, 
at the University of Florida. He is the author, and this is very important because it's apparently widely used in courses and schools, and some of you no doubt teach it. Um, his book about uh, Black and Latinx history. Uh, in fact, when we first started talking about these sessions, I think it was Steve Armstrong who said, you got to get, you got to get Paul Ortiz, start with Paul Ortiz. <laughs> so I did. He's also the author, he's also the author of Emancipation Betrayed, the Hidden History of Black Organizing and White Violence in Florida. And Paul, I, I never had a chance to tell you this, I'm doing a new biography of James Walden Johnson from Jacksonville, and your book has many things that I have already ripped off. <laughs> but I haven't written anything yet, so don't worry. Um, <laughs> um, he's also the president of the United Faculty of Florida, uh, part of the CIO. He's a union man. And last but not least, Eric Foner. Now, I've never found it easy to introduce Eric, but I'll do it real quick. Um, Eric's one of the greatest historians the United States has ever known. He's been my uh, kind of hero and model. He hates to hear me say this um, for many, many years. His books include Free, Lo Free Soul, Free Labor, Free Men, the book on Tom Paine, the book Fiery Trial about Lincoln, which won him the Pulitzer, uh, and a whole slew of other prizes, but also uh, the textbook, Give Me Liberty, which the last I checked, and I'm a textbook author too, Nobody catches up. It seems to be the best seller at college level and a lot of high school level as well. Um, so we have many perspectives here. I've asked all of them to prepare 10 minutes or so on how do we write this pluralistic American history now after actually generations uh, of and decades of tremendous change in how American history is researched, written, and taught. Is there a United States history anymore? Uh, I think we were gonna have Eric, you go first. Is that all right? Okay. Oh, he heard me, good. Yeah. <laughs> You're up first, Professor Foner. Thank you, David, and I, I want to apologize, uh, so to speak, to uh, the people there that I haven't been able to uh, be with you in person uh, because uh, basically of COVID, uh, my wife uh, tested positive the other day, um, et cetera. So I'm happy to be there um, sort of in absentia. Um, I thought I'd begin for a minute or two with how I came to write a U.S. history textbook, because, um, you know, I had been for many years, I've been invited to take part in one uh, kind of textbook project or another. I always said no. Uh, but in the night, some of you may remember that in the late 80s, 19, early 90s, when social history was uh, sort of in its heyday, um, there was a sort of debate going on among historians about you know, is there too much fragmentation of American history that, you know, each group gets its own history, et cetera, and what happened to the cohesive narrative we used to have? And then the practitioners of social history came back and said, well, wait a minute, the, the, the sort of big textbook narrative is inherently limited and one-dimensional and cannot incorporate the real diversity of American society. And I uh, decided to try to do that, uh, to have a uh, inclusive narrative. And it resulted in a book, not a textbook, called The Story of American Freedom, which um, uh, did uh, trace the idea of freedom and different groups' understanding of it from the revolution to the present. When I turned it into my publisher, uh, he said, uh, the editor, <laughs> excuse me, said, you know, you've got like half a textbook here just in this book. If you just add a few facts, you could have an American history textbook with freedom as its theme and battles over freedom. And uh, I said, oh, that sounds like a good idea. And uh, so I expanded the story of American freedom into Give Me Liberty, uh, uh, et cetera, which is, as David said, widely used since then. 
uh, in uh, colleges, AP courses, et cetera, et cetera. And the solution to the problem of <coughs> to narrative and uh, inclusiveness was to make it a contested narrative that the theme of freedom, who is entitled to freedom, what kind of social arrangements are necessary to enable people to enjoy it, who should enjoy freedom, um, these ideas are inherently contested. Uh, the point is that freedom is not a fixed idea or a straight line of progress, but an open-ended history of contestation. Um, that perspective makes possible the incorporation of the different groups that make up American society <coughs> as part of a coherent narrative. Uh, not just dropped in from time to time. Um, when I began working on the textbook, my colleague at Columbia, John Garrity, who was the author of a very successful <laughs> U.S. history textbook, said to me, what makes a textbook good is what you leave out. A textbook is an exercise in selection. Uh, you cannot cover everything. And if you try to do that, it becomes unwieldy and unmanageable and unreadable. And the freedom theme enabled me to, to create a basis for inclusion and selection. Every group in American history talks about freedom, but <laughs> often in very uh, different ways. Um, and the freedom theme also enables us to expand the definition of inclusiveness, not just racial and ethnic inclusiveness, but uh, class inclusiveness as well. Uh, there's more about the labor movement in my textbook than in almost any other textbook I know of, except Who Built America, which is a labor history textbook. But again, <laughs> freedom is the backbone of the narrative. The through line of freedom enables us to include many different voices as a natural part of the presentation of uh, history. Ironically, the freedom theme also enables us or requires us to have a strong focus on slavery and its legacies. In our history, slavery <laughs> and freedom are conceptually intertwined, as David's predecessor, David Ryan Davis at Yale, certainly made us uh, understand. But also that the struggles for freedom of different groups <laughs> powerfully affected how other groups in the society understood uh, the idea of freedom. Now, every three years, I have produced a sort of a revised edition of the textbook for complicated reasons I don't want to go into here. But each time, a, a, there's sort of added emphasis on one or another theme or subject. In the sixth edition, the last one, the theme was who is an American, which was hotly debated at the time, of course, in American society. And um, certainly enabled us to uh, move even further with the question of inclusiveness, because that debate has taken place through it all the way from the beginning of American history. In the next edition, the seventh edition, which is just being published, <laughs> I added two new authors to assist in the or to take part in the revision process. Uh, Kathleen Duval of uh, North Carolina and Lisa McGurr of Harvard, uh, partly because both are experts on Native American history. And I'm happy to admit, I mean, I'm not happy, but I, I must admit that Native American history probably didn't get as much attention as it deserves in previous editions. But I think those who look at the current uh, edition about to be published will find a considerable amount uh, uh, added about that. Uh, and I think that that subject, that area has become, as you all know, a major source of scholarship 
in the last uh, decade uh, or so. But the, but again, adding Native American conceptions of freedom introduces new elements, which then spread to other groups in the society, particularly the equation of freedom and sovereignty, which is not something that is that common among many other groups in American history. So in other words, the unity of the narrative is provided by the struggle itself over freedom and different understandings of what is as meant, and that enables us to be inclusive without sacrificing coherence or falling into a Whiggish narrative of inexorable progress toward a predetermined goal. <laughs> I'm going to stop by simply quoting in each edition of the textbook, I put my email address at the beginning and invite students and teachers to um, write to me with their comments, and many of them do. Apart from the students who asked me to do their homework for them, which is a <laughs> considerable number, um, <laughs> let me just read you a couple of quotes to show how this theme and inclusiveness has worked. This is from an AP teacher. For the first few years of teaching, I struggled to find a through line, something students could always come back to, to understand what it all means. At some point, I picked up an edition of Give Me Liberty and read about your goals for the book. You write about the ever-changing definition of freedom. That was it, what I had been looking for. I ran around like a crazy person, sharing it with my colleagues. I was so excited. Um, here is a bit of a, set, a letter from a student referring to the large amount of space in the book about marginalized groups and struggles against slavery and for women's rights and dignity in the workplace. Your work has not only changed my way of viewing American history, but also created a moral compass for me. I like that. In other words, this student sees the connection between the contested history of freedom and the world he and us are living in. This textbook has held unprecedented value for me, says another student, and I want to thank you. Today, when at times it seems we are fighting an uphill battle to preserve human rights, I have found your commentaries on how the disenfranchised and mistreated <laughs> classes of American society embraced and defended the ideal of freedom. This student has gotten the point that the struggle for freedom, as different groups understand it, has been the dynamic enabling greater degrees of freedom for everybody. It's not just one group, one group. This affects everybody's uh, understanding and experiences of uh, freedom. So in other words, my answer to the question on which this panel centers, yes, it is possible to write a textbook that gives proper attention to the diversity of the society and its history, while understanding history as a story of progress and retrogression, making the point that freedom can be both gained and lost, and that its enjoyment requires eternal vigilance. Thank you. Thanks, Eric, and take care of that cough. Yeah, I know, it's drag. Yeah, I think I'll briefly, briefly take my mask off for uh, just some really um, introductory remarks. Um, I'm really delighted to hear that Professor Foner in his seventh edition of Give Me Liberty has enlisted the assistance of specialists in Native American history, uh, who would probably pretty quickly come to understand that the theme of freedom is not a successful kind of operative framework as we currently understand it for understanding North American history from the perspective of Native America. Um, in fact, it's probably the opposite, that the expansion of individual liberties and various kind of liberalistic practices like property rights, um, political jurisdiction and other 
kind of nationalist um, state formations has disproportionately affected Native Americans uh, more than any other social communities in North America. So that's great to hear that there's a, a modification forthcoming. Um, but I guess my answer to the question about this panel's possibilities is that yes, it is possible to write a history of the United States from, but that is pluralistic, but not in our current operative categories of analysis. And sadly, after you know, roughly 30 years of graduate training and faculty instruction, I still have that kind of fairly strong um, recognition of the historiographical limitations that pervade the study of American history in these regards. And we could take the first six editions of Give Me Liberty if we wanted to, or perhaps more popular recent surveys like these truths by Jill Lepore as kind of instances or manifestations of some of these problematic paradigmatic uh, formations. So if we take the nation state as a presumptive kind of vessel of inquiry, we have to kind of think about those whose lives and those whose lands and those whose resources were lost and expropriated as um, necessary conditions for that development, uh, seriously. And that's what the field of Native American history obviously has been doing for quite some time. And we're now at the point where we can have kind of um, parallel or kind of joint conversations in these regards. And I've worked with Professor Foner in other capacities. Um, I was incredibly delighted to be invited to offer the first historiographical essay on Native America for the third edition of his original version of the New American History, uh, commissioned by the American Historical Association. Uh, that was in 2012. Um, the um, opportunity to do that was really quite um, exciting, uh, but there were still limitations within the volume itself. Uh, the Jacksonian America uh, chapter um, didn't talk about Indian removal as a central feature of Jacksonian America. So uh, we can kind of create these subfield infrastructural uh, revisions or ad additions, uh, but we're still kind of only in a game of kind of incremental engagements if we don't seriously rethink kind of substantive um, frames of analysis, temporalities, uh, spatial assessments that pervade uh, the structure of much of American historiographical practice. I know this sounds critical or kind of daunting or overwhelming, um, but I am kind of an optimist um, and have certain hopeful uh, uh, visions of alternative um, uh, futures and um, uh, realities that I think are still possible. And if one were to gauge the study of Native American historiography over the past 20 years or so, one would see a marked uh, contradistinction to the current kind of the current state of uh, study versus previous generations. Um, this year, for example, uh, Princeton hist history just hired their first Native Americanist, making now every Ivy League history department uh, home to or previously home to a, a, a specialist in the field. Uh, that would have been inconceivable um, even probably even five or ten years ago let alone 20 or 25 when some of us were just starting out in this kind of unusual vocational undertaking so um, this is a field that offers a tremendous then space for engagement uh, we use kind of differential um, sometimes uh, frames of analysis conceptual moorings uh, people perhaps have heard fairly Frequently in recent years, the term settler colonialism is kind of a, a parad paradigm of engagement that the field of Native American and indigenous studies has kind of birthed. It came out of the Commonwealth world of scholars like Patrick Wolf and others dissatisfied with post-colonial theory in the late 1990s, um, kind of gained traction in Canada and uh, um, Polynesia and kind of is now filtering into American historiographical assessments uh, somewhat haphazardly at times. Um, um, my next project after the one David mentioned is on the limits of settler colonialism, just a more kind of conceptual project. Um, but let me just briefly um, introduce my entry into this field of the conversation about US history as a kind of um, a totality. So there haven't been really successful interpretive overviews of Native American history. I've been teaching the field since 1999. 
and have yet to find a textbook that I think works. The best selling version is a documentary history, <laughs> which is full of documents um, and a lot of sometimes uh, um, somewhat unhelpful um, kind of extended introductions to very specific documents from the past. And this is by Colin Calloway, the field leader at Dartmouth College, who's done more probably to institutionalize Native American history than anyone over the last 35 years through a series of just incredibly important um, studies, particularly around the revolutionary era. Um, so this project that I just offered does try to do this. Um, it was overwhelming kind of challenge. Um, I had to jettison a lot of like archaeological and pre-contact or pre-Columbian ambitions. Um, other projects like Francis Jennings, the Founders of America, um, my colleague at um, Oxford's Pekka Hamalainen's recent attempt, they both try to do more substantive engagement with the pre-contact world than I'm able to do, uh, partly because I'm not really trained in the material culture of early America in those ways. And I'm, like many of us here, a historian, of US history, a historian trained in historiography and literature and archives and documents and other kind of methods that in many ways are limitations to my interests at times. So nonetheless, that kind of commitment has kind of, while preclusive of certain things, um, positioned me to think through what American history might look like from the vantage point of this field. So I divided the book in half uh, and used um, uh, like Lepore, 1787 is an important temporality, but rather than seeing that as the kind of primary beginnings of American history, I, I see it as the kind of midpoint. And so the first part of the book is called Indians and Empires, and it surveys in fairly extended form uh, the formation of French and Spanish and British um, empires in the 17th and 18th century, and then looks at the clash of empires between England, France, and indigenous peoples across the Ohio River country in particular, identifies what I suggest um, as the indigenous origins of the American Revolution, I believe, based on Pat Spiro's book, Frontier Rebels, that came out a couple years ago, that really the conflict in Western Pennsylvania in 1764 and 1765 should be seen as an elemental theater of the American revolutionary struggle in ways that very few scholars up to this point have historically wanted to see it. Uh, the first shots, I believe, fired against British soldiers by US settlers are in May, I'm sorry, in March in 1765, outside Fort Loudoun, between uh, backcountry settler militias known as the Black Boys against British soldiers who are provisioning Indian allies in the interior following the proclamation of 1763. Um, that kind of frontier militia mentality, uh, Spiro argues, is the first time the word frontier is actually enters into the lexicon of revolutionary political culture or British political culture in, uh, of the colonial world. And somehow it finds its way into the Declaration, where Indians are described as merciless Indian savages. So that's kind of evidentiary, kind of, uh, to my mind, uh, empiricism that speaks to a centrality that sadly a lot of historians of early America have not been willing to successfully, to really seriously um, engage until recently. So drawing on that kind of work, this chapter five is on the revolution, chapter six in is on the constitution, where Indians are a central figure, uh, central prominently to the formation of uh, the US constitutional form. Um, I could go through this. So there's a chapter on the Civil War, as David knows. Um, now, perhaps Professor Foner might be interested as also hearing, as many of you are Civil War historians. Um, so it's called Collapse and Total War. Uh, it's about the Indian wars of the Civil War era, when tens of thousands of Native peoples are killed at the hands of either US military forces or state militias using federal funds. Uh, ben Madley is shown in Northern California in Humboldt County in 17 or in 1861 in June. Militias are killing Indians using federal funding. Uh, this is before Bull Run. Um, are these not the first casualties of the US Civil War? Um, first federally funded uh, killings uh, using federal uh, resources. And this follows what he calls the state killing machine that is established during the California gold rush and the first territorial government of California. So this kind of attempt to unmake American history, I think, is needed before we can move towards a kind of unified uh, pluralistic narrative of America. Thank you. And um, that's why the subtitle of this book is, has the phrasing, the unmaking of America or the unmaking of US history. Because if we can kind of decenter kind of previous forms or presumptions, uh, we may be able to see things in a new 
light and form. Um, there are obviously real consequences to this. Um, as I uh, outlined in my concerns with Lepore's These Truths, uh, Professor Ortiz and I were invited to do a forum in the American Historical Review on that title. Um, and I noted then and have become recently reminded that uh, kind of the uh, thinking of contemporary American jurists and policymakers on these issues often reflects a certain um, misunderstanding, essentially, of kind of essential elements of American historical formation, in which indigenous affairs and laws and concerns are at the heart of a lot of the original kind of founding era's thinking. It's, um, uh, Greg Oblowski at Stanford has written a series of important studies about um, the U.S. Constitution, the centrality of Native peoples to its eventual form. Um, others have kind of expanded upon that and seen um, this essentially the way in which the treaty power of the federal government essentially provides the federal government its capacity to do a whole range of things, including acquiring lands from France, including concluding uh, conflicts with England. And so when I say that I'm uh, proud, um, even though I didn't know, understand it at the time, even though the Jay Treaty is why in part I went to school in Canada, because it was, I was unbeknownst to me, uh, eligible for uh, Canadian resident tuition, because the Jay Treaty offers a uh, uh, passage between the Canadian US border that the federal government recognized with England in 1794. I had no idea at the time why that was the case, but tribal members have certain political um, standings uh, recognized by the federal government that very few people actually have any understanding about. And so the theme of sovereignty is essential to Native American history. And if we were to make sovereignty the theme rather than freedom, we would see a very different kind of theme of American historical inquiry in which diminishment and expansion in which retained jurisdiction um, is a much kind of more salient feature of even contemporary US political life. And so states have historically been deeply antagonistic to tribal communities. You can look at Jacksonian America, you can look at uh, Reagan era America, you can look at a whole range of periods in US history and see that kind of uh, state concern. There's a Supreme Court case being, held next, being heard next Wednesday uh, in which states like Texas and Indiana and Louisiana are all arguing that uh, the federal government is uh, usurping some of the state's rights over child welfare issues in, in a case called Burkine versus Holland or Holland versus Burkine about the constitutionality of the 1978 Indian Child Welfare Act. Um, so if we understood sovereignty as a conceptual frame, we would be able to say, no, the federal government has always had the domain over the care and education of Native children dating back to the earliest treaties it entered into. The first treaties, first seven treaties ratified by the U.S. Senate are all with Native nations. And if we think like um, uh, many in the kind of world of sociological theory, that one learns how to do something by puzzling before you power through something, you could say that Indian treaties provide the Senate the way of puzzling before it can solve an eventual power or problem. And Jefferson, as many may know, never wanted to enter into any kind of um, uh, to have the Senate to have the kind of disproportionate power that it eventually had, which essentially um, um, uh, precluded his initial interests in acquiring Louisiana to that form. Eventually, he changes his mind. Um, but those are the kind of dimensions that this field kind of offers. Uh, so we can move there, but to get there, I think we'll have to uh, refashion and 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 link and see uh, our subjects uh, much more relationally than divided. And so the project that I just uh, completed is an attempt to provide an overview of Native American history um, through some of these lenses. Thanks for the uh, invitation to be here, David. Uh, nice to see everyone again and to meet uh, some for the first time. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much, David, for this invitation. I love being on this panel and learning so much already. Uh, I'm pretty sure that in my email from you, it said something like 13 to 14 minutes. So I can pull up the <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> um, 
<laughs> First, uh, it's important to offer a caveat. I'm sure that you've seen Asian Americans uh, connected with Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders under the UBRIC AA and HPI. This is a, uh, an umbrella coalition term that often has great, um, uh, great uh, possibilities and coalition building. However, there is no way to collapse, and as I'll be sharing about some more, um, collapse these very diverse histories into one group history. And so for the purposes of this conversation, I'm going to be talking about Asian American history. I think it's also important to point out that Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders can um, feel some affinities with Asian American groups, but are uh, predominantly consider themselves indigenous peoples as well. Um, so David, you've asked us to solve or help solve the question, because we are, I don't think we're going to get there today, but help solve the question of writing an American history that encompasses all peoples into a pluralistic story of the American past. And like Ned, I don't think we're there yet, certainly in the field of Asian American history. I'm thinking about some of the terms that Ned just um, shared in the frameworks, incremental inclusion. Um, I know that when I go into the classroom, the first thing that I do with my students is uh, kind of temperature taking. What do we know? What do we know about Asian American history? Here's the board. Here's a pen. Go at it. This is before we've opened up the syllabus, before uh, I've opened my mouth to even share an introductory lecture. And uh, unfortunately, the most common uh, answer is not much. Or there's lots and lots of check marks next to, you know, two events. The Chinese built the railroad and Japanese Americans were interned, not incarcerated, but interned. Um, so that's that's my beginning point uh, when I welcome students into not just Asian American history, but, but American history courses as well. So one of the challenges um, in teaching Asian American history is of course, the invisibility of Asian American history, the almost complete lack of Asian American history in K-12 education in our textbooks. And I'm gonna to get to that in a little bit. The other immense challenge is diversity. The Asian American population is around 22 million people. It's um, a category that is meant to allow people who can trace their ancestral roots back to East Asia, South Asia, and Southeast Asia. That represents at least 24 different ethnic groups, a great diversity of religious faiths, let alone if we then connect it to US history, uh, generation, class, gender, sexual orientation, et cetera. So diversity is essential in teaching about, writing about, um, researching Asian American history. And it's important to note that these differences, of course, then relate to distinct historical and contemporary experiences. It's fair to ask whether there is even one Asian America or one Asian American history. There's great diversity within Asian America and across Asian American history, but of course, when we are writing or teaching, we're selecting, we're including. When I've been writing great syntheses of um, Asian American history, I have to find both those that balance between diversity as well as um, similarities and connections within that Asian American umbrella. And then, uh, of course, across groups with African Americans, with the Native Americans, with Latinx communities as well. So for 
me, it's that balance between diversity as well as shared experiences of Asian Americans that reveals that complex, I'm gonna bring back together some terms from this morning, complex, complicated, contradictory histories um, that define not just Asian America, but America. So is there a unified story? We're not there yet. Asian American studies, Asian American history is a relatively new field. Certainly there have been scholars who have studied, researched, written, published about Asian Americans, um, but we typically date the field of Asian American studies to the third world strike, 1968, 1969, happened in the Bay Area. It was part of the ethnic studies movement. That is where the um, histories that we now recognize as Asian American uh, history was written from community members using community archives um, in concert with uh, the push for ethnic studies. So we are um, still playing catch up in terms of the scholarship research and teaching. When I have tried to introduce my students to the the great span diversity of Asian American history, I've tended to revise the standard chronology, uh, chrono chronology, chronology of, um, of where Asian Americans typically show up in American history. We typically show up uh, in 1849, 1850 with the California Gold Rush. And that's when I first started to research that was going to be my beginning point too when I wrote the making of Asian America, but then I realized we were here before. <laughs> we were here before. We were here even before the nation's founding. And we were in the Americas centuries before that as well. And so in fact you can't understand how the Chinese got to California in 1848, 950 until we moved backwards to the so-called coolie trade, till we move backwards to the Manila galleon trade that connected um, Spain's uh, Pacific Empire for the first time. And so for me, I, I go all the way back into global history, history of, of the Spanish, um, Spanish uh, conquest and imperialism in ways that was certainly not trained for in graduate school. Um, and then a new edition, published last summer focuses on Asian American activism during the COVID-19 pandemic. So that's a lot of time to cover, centuries to cover um, in one book. The um, other uh, framing that I have chosen is not just global histories of empire, which include, again, everything from Spain's Pacific empire, but also US annexation of Hawaii, the Philippines, um, uh, the Cold War empire that pushes us into Asia, um, continuing during the Korean War, the wars in Southeast Asia, um, and the war on terror. But centrally, Asian American history defined as US histories of M slash migration and race. So this would include both mass migration but also the ways in which the xenophobia and racism targeting Asians turned the United States into a gatekeeping nation with deportation laws, detention um, centers, um, surveillance, immigra immigration ID cards, et cetera, things that we are very familiar with as well. It also includes centuries of racial violence which can be seen through, um, in one lens, the 1871 Chinese massacre uh, in LA, 151 years ago, and the mass shooting in Atlanta in 2021. One more theme is transnational diasporas that have linked Asians in the United States and Asian Americans to their ancestral homelands, as well as to diasporic communities across the globe. But I want to end, so if, if diversity is one of these main themes that is a challenge to Asian American history, I want to end by going back to that theme of invisibility. The Asian American population in the United States has increased by 88% in the past two decades. But if you open up most of our US history textbooks, 
we are simply not there or we're there as token footnotes. So one of our questions for today is how are we capturing not only these erased histories, but also doing the work to help the newest communities to preserve and share their own histories. I'm gonna share a, a few statistics. In a recent survey of American adults in which participants were asked to name a well-known Asian American, the most common answer was don't know. This is after the 2020 elections and after the election of our first vice female vice president who is both who identifies both as African American and Asian American. A substantial percentage of those who did claim to know something about Asian American history cited either cultural holidays, the entire category of food or events that occurred in Asia. Even when prompted with specific events, such as the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882, racial and religious profiling of South Asians after 9-11, the 1982 murder of Vincent Chin, most respondents admitted that they were, quote, not at all familiar with these events. A recent survey of K-12 history curricula standards from all 50 states found that Asian Americans are largely invisible. 18 states include zero Asian American content, seven included just one. I'm thinking about um, Donald Yakovon's um, um, citation of previous um, historic textbooks in which the exclusion of African Americans was seen as um, that entire population having not done anything to merit inclusion. Researchers have found that when Asian Americans were included in the textbooks, they were either primarily depicted as victims with little to no agency or as new immigrants who have made no contribution to the country. Only a fraction of standards depict Asian Americans as change agents through civil rights activism. So what are the consequences? The consequences of this invisibility, this erasure, has um, laid the foundations for ignorance, for hate, and for violence. History is not about learning about the past. It's also about belonging, about insisting that we, the people, include all of the people in the United States. When entire communities and groups have been erased, ignored, or dismissed as significant members and as actors in this shared history, we are also erasing, ignoring, and dismissing them as significant members and actors in the United States today. That is why stereotypes as Asian Americans, as spies, as terrorists, as unassimilable foreigners, as model minorities dominate the ways in which entire communities are viewed and understood. So that's the very frank assessment of where I see Asian American history, not just in um, our K-12 classrooms, not just in our college classrooms, but in our public sphere. I do want to end on a note of hope like the morning's panel um, inspired us to do. And that is by looking at our students, by giving them the tools to act and to shape their own education. Since 2021, there's something that's been happening around the country that I've been calling Asian American racial reckonings. Five cities have officially apologized for their histories of anti-Asian violence, Antioch, California, San Jose, California, LA, San Francisco, and Denver. Four states have passed legislation to require Asian American history as a graduation requirement, Illinois, New Jersey, Rhode Island, and yeah. Connecticut. <laughs> Recently, President Biden signed a bill to establish a commission to study the creation of a National Museum of Asian Pacific American History and Culture. Asian American history has become central to Asian Americans' racial reckoning and the Stop AAPI movement. It has become a source of power, resistance, and inspiration. Recently, I had the opportunity to interview high school students who are part of uh, the New Jersey branch of Make Us Visible. This is an organization that lobbies for the teaching of Asian American Pacific Islander history 
in high schools. And these students told me how during the pandemic, as they, their classmates, their grandparents, their community members were experiencing hate and violence, they felt that they could not just sit inside and do nothing. So they organized. Some of them started their own magazines. Some of them started their own organizations. Many of them became um, active with Make Us Visible chapters, including here in Connecticut. And in New Jersey, on January 18th, 2022, Governor Phil Murphy signed the bill that would incorporate Asian American history into the curriculum. But they also reminded me that the struggle did not end there because what they raised was what happens next? We have this bill, but who's gonna teach it? Who's gonna write the curriculum? How do we know that what's being included in the classroom is inclusive, is true, is the right history. So I look forward to hearing from all of you teachers to see how we can do that together so that this generation and the next doesn't have to feel like they are invisible anymore. Thank you very much. Thank you, and thank you guys for your presentations. Thank you for coming. Um, I'm really enjoying this conference and this panel. Um, I, um, I come, my point of entry on, on the question of inclusive history is as someone who's written a textbook uh, in African-American history, Freedom on My Mind. And it's also as someone who routinely teaches both African-American and American histories in separate courses. Um, and occasionally teach a, a course of my own devising, which is a history of race, place, and space in America, which um, kind of looks at all the different groups and uses frameworks from settler colonialism and geography to kind of think about how this all comes together. Um, and I, I guess I partially get to that because I am, I've been troubled for a long time and are maybe more troubled now than I ever have been before about the degree to which you can really sync African-American history and American history together. Um, my textbook, um, Freedom on My Mind, uh, is sort of built at least partially around the idea that African-American history is American history, and they do mesh it so far as African-American history really falls around some of the same uh, timelines African American history has been really central to events I would contend you can't un really understand American history without understanding African American history, but I do not see. Um, students necessarily getting inclusive understandings of African American history from what they learn in school or even many of their college courses. Um, one thing that surprised me over the years and surprised me again with the sort of um controversy over the 1619 project and then the sort of attacks on critical race theory is the extent to which African American history isn't really fully penetrating the narrative. Many of the insights of the 1619 project shouldn't have been a revelation to people, nor should some of its claims have been so controversial. Um, yet they are, and I've I shouldn't be surprised by this because um, I find that teach in teaching African American history, I often end up startling my students by talking about atrocities they've never heard of, introducing them to people and problems they've never previously encountered. Um, each year when I teach African American history, I um, I end up conveying information that seems so new to students that I sometimes feel like I'm circulating some kind of contraband. <laughs> um, I often get questions like one I'll quote from a recent Penn student who submitted a discussion assignment containing the question, how come I took American history throughout grade school and yet never had a class like this or a week of readings like this? Um, 
these kind of questions weren't surprising to me back in the 1990, early 1990s when I first started teaching. At that point, there was less work on African American history. There was less people who specialized it, but I'm surprised and a little discouraged to see them persisting 30 years later as the field has become more prominent within the profession, as books about Black history have proliferated. And it all makes me wonder how well academic historians are doing when it comes to incorporating insights from several generations of work in African American history into the narratives we teach about American history writ large. In fact, it makes me wonder whether African American history flourishes largely as a subfield, which when it's taught supplements traditional narratives in American history without changing them. That's a problem I sometimes have to confront even in my own practice of teaching um, because I teach both fields. Um, and I always find teaching African-American history so much more depressing than teaching American history, which is strange because it's all coming at the same time. But in teaching African-American history, you follow a narrative trajectory in which any the hard fought social and political process uh, progress achieved by black protagonists um, is invariably fo followed by devastating reversals. Um, first published in 1966 and uh, one widely used African American history textbook made no attempt to disguise this tra trajectory. It was actually called From Plantation to Ghetto, an interpretive history of American Negroes. By, con by contrast, when you teach an American history survey, especially if you use any sort of textbook, you tell a different story. American history textbooks, both past and present, often have uplifting titles such as The Enduring Vision, The American Promise, Out of Many, uh, Eric Foner's The Story of American Freedom, though Give Me Liberty takes it a, puts it a little bit more of a question. Um, and so in teaching American history, we, we sort of end up sketching the progress of, um, in which um, Americans come together as a nation and cherish democratic ideals. Social and economic inequality are important themes in many recent ed editions of American history textbooks, but the overall story they tell is more upbeat. So I've been trying to imagine um, and wondering whether we'll ever get a version of American history in which these traditions merge, in which we tell America's history at its messiest and its darkest with all the parts working together. Um, like Erica Lee and Ned Blackhawk, I suspect it will require an entirely new narrative with different categories of analysis. Um, it's a story that might not exist anywhere except in the imagination of James Baldwin, who once maintained that American history is longer, larger, more various, more beautiful, and more terrible than anything anyone has ever said about it. Um, and Baldwin, who made this point in 1963, was calling not just for an American history in which Negroes learned more about themselves and their contribution to the culture. He was also calling for one that would teach white people about their own history by engaging the ways in which the nation took shape around people who were poor, people who were hungry, people who were convicted felons. Uh, we had to go beyond a series of myths about one's heroic ancestors. Um, and I think to, I mean, we, we, need more, we need more categories of analysis to do that. Um, I do think freedom is a really important theme, and I understand why Eric Foner puts his sort of framework for the textbook around freedom. Um, I think we need themes beyond freedom, and we also maybe need to think about the way that freedom is often abused as a concept in American history as well as used. Um, you know, it's especially I think it's especially obvious to someone who's lived through our era that's this, the, you know, we have freedoms that are states' rights freedoms. We have freedoms that are the, the freedom to tramp on other people's rights, uh, the freedoms to appropriate other people's land. Like we can talk about freedom, but we need to really begin to talk about the ways in which freedom is often, often has a very dark side in American history. It's often used as a, a, a sort of license uh, to take from other people to um, to have 
claim rights at the expense of other people. So we need to we need to trouble the idea of American freedom. And in general, we I mean, if we can do anything as historians, we need to push our students to approach history as a field that troubles everything you think you know about almost anything. Thank you. <laughs> Oh, I think you're next. Process of elimination. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. How's everyone doing? Do we need to get up, do, like do a stretch or something? Or <laughs> Okay, now I usually follow as a lecturer, University of Florida, the three and out rule. What I mean by that is, uh, is uh, I look at an audience and one student has fallen asleep, I'm thinking, well, they probably were partying last night. Two students, well, maybe they're partying together. <laughs> Three students, it's on me. Um, but to take all of the suspense out of my brief presentation, and you know, I really uh, just want to stop and just say thank you for having me. It's just an honor to be with such incredible colleagues. Um, I've learned so much. Uh, the, the film last night was was spectacular. Uh, being able to be reunited with my dear colleague, Hassan Jeffries, from the Ohio State University is, is, is a great honor. Um, I took some pictures of him in action, uh, which were very compelling, I hope. But so to take the suspense out, I mean, I, I guess I follow my, my colleagues to say that, you know, we're not there yet, um, but I am hopeful. What a cop out. <laughs> Collective bargaining. That's how we have defended critical race theory in the state of Florida, unions. The conversations that we're having today, we wouldn't have a lot of these conversations in the state of Florida. I, I hope we're, we, we, we recognize that, right? My dear colleague, uh, Dr. Butler, Mike Butler from, from Flagler. Um, we've had to use the grievance machinery of our union to defend colleagues and several different colleges at the University of Florida even have the opportunity to use the term critical race theory. We were told a couple of years ago by well-meaning administrators, don't even have that in your syllabi. And if you do, maybe you should, maybe it's time for you to find a job outside of Florida. These are <laughs> professors. K through 12 teachers have it much worse. The 1619 curriculum, we can't have a debate about that in Florida. It's illegal. It's been banned. So I, I, I hate to be the, Flo the Florida person. We sound churlish, <laughs> don't we? Um, I wanted to talk about an African-American and Latinx history in the United States, and especially the work I've done with school districts because in different parts of the country, this is what makes me hopeful. Since this book was published and the charge that I had for this book was, Paul, can you write a history of the U.S. from roughly 1776 to present? At that time, present was like 2014 or 15 or something. Um, and can you do it in less than 200 pages? It's like, oh my God, okay, I'll try. No, yeah, no, the answer was no, but you know, you, you, you work with what you have, right? Um, but seriously, since the publication of the book, I mean, I always had done a lot of work with school districts, but especially since the Black Lives Matter movement resurgence, and I really wanna get us to think about that because it's high school students who are demanding the changes now. It's so exciting for me because for years I've taught about like the Chicano blowouts, the third world ethnic studies movement in San Francisco State, what happened in Garfield High School in Los Angeles in 1968, uh, Carlos Munoz, who is a student then, who's one of my mentors. But now it's happening in the middle schools and the high schools. Kids are walking out. They're going on strike. They're demanding that their family stories be told. I had the great honor of working for over a year as a consultant with the, the, the Connecticut Board of Education and the rolling out of that curriculum in African-American, Latino, and Puerto Rican history and it was a challenge. You know, it wasn't always a smooth process. It's a lot of history, y'all. It's a lot of history. 
But again, we had to remind ourselves periodically, the reason we were even there together doing this work was the students, the courageous high school, middle school students. And I watched some of that testimony on YouTube and it will bring tears to your eyes. Young Afro-Latino students saying, where is my people's history in this? Or in Florida, that what, wrote, what kind of drove me to write African-American Latinx history, the way I wrote it, I have generations of Cuban-American students saying, well, Professor Ortiz, surely our history in the U.S. doesn't begin in 1959, right? Or Mexican students saying, you know, surely our history is much more than being migrant farm workers, is it not? And a lot of my students saying, you know, Paul, it's great you teach Black history one semester and Latino history the next semester. We need you to teach them together. These were students, and when I first offered the course that became this book, it was through the Department of Anthropology at Duke University. It wasn't even the history department. And it was because I had a lot of students, and I was still a grad student, actually. A lot of my students were pre-med, you know, labor movement oriented, pre-law. They were headed towards some, you know, kind of work in migrant, immigrant communities. And they said, we need you to begin bringing these stories together. Because when I was in grad school in North Carolina in the 1990s, there was an explosion of Latino people coming into a state, which historically had been the black white binary, right? Um, and so that's why they demanded that I, I begin to, to teach those histories to, together uh, instead of always separate. C.L.R. James, the great revolutionary scholar, said in 1962 in a book he wrote on party politics in the West Indies, the more active the people are, the more active government can be. The more active the people are, the more active the government can be. And this certainly applies to the fields that we're talking about today. As long as there's a popular movement, popular movements, such as Erica mentioned uh, just a moment ago. And as long as we can find ways to stay connected with those in our classrooms, uh, in our campuses, uh, out in the streets, as long as we can stay connected with those popular movements, we'll have a chance. Once we lo lose connection to those movements, we have no chance whatsoever. Is the, movement against anti, is the movement against critical race theory a rear guard action? That was a phrase that a bunch of us who are from Florida were sitting together. We heard that term this morning. Is it a rear guard action? Well, in Florida, it's a front guard action. <laughs> um, but but that's, that's also a yes and no. I believe, again, my, the optimist to me is like, you know, I'm working with a school district that serves about 200,000 students right now. And I can't tell you where it is, but None of, the, none of the superintendents I'm working with, none of the curriculum directors are like revolutionary people, but they're asking for a revolutionary curriculum. And what they're saying is, Paul, can you provide individuals or movements that my new uh, minority majority school district kids can actually relate to? And please, no more Alexander Hamilton. <laughs> the students, the students are fed up. <laughs> you know, can you find other people? The music's okay, but the, no the music's great. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, I we have traditions. If you look at the people on this, uh, all of us on this panel, on the previous panel, who our mentors were: Cedric Robinson, John Hope Franklin, Vicky Ruiz, Patricia Savea. Ronald Takaki, I mean, all these incredible people who, who open these spaces for us. And now I feel like it's our job to keep those spaces open for our students. One of the other things that gives me hope is that when I finished African American Latin History in the US, that was at the moment when what we used to call Hispanic history or Chicano history or now Latinx history really went international. And what I mean by this is that especially that first um, Hispanic Heritage Month 
after the resurgence of the Black Lives Matter movement, my Hispanic Heritage Month blew up. I had three times as many lectures, workshops, and talks in the fall of 2020. And it was thanks to the Black Lives Matter movement. Suddenly, we had to confront our history. Honestly, candidly, people have asked me, is African-American Latinx history, the US, is, is it a hopeful book? I've had people come out of workshops in tears. They say, I never knew this history. I went to college. I have a doctorate, or I'm a medical doctor, I'm a lawyer. I've never, I didn't, didn't know this stuff. Paul, is it a hopeful book? I don't know. <laughs> I really don't know. But in all seriousness, corporations now are picking up on this. I didn't plan to talk about this, but I've given presentations on Hispanic Heritage Month and Black History Month based out of African American Latinx history of the US to like Bank of America, <laughs> Deutsche Bank, ConAgra. I'm anti-capitalist, <laughs> you know? And, and the first time I got a call, I remember like Alliant Capital, they called me and they said, Professor Ortiz, we want you to do our, our Hispanic Heritage Month keynote. And I said, you have read chapter five, the government of American banks. I'm like, yeah, yeah. And, but we've had great conversations. And, and it, what I want to emphasize is that these corporations have affinity groups or ERGs, employee resource groups, right? And they are demanding this kind of, uh, you know, this kind of more complex approach to history. The folks at ConAgra contacted me, they said, Professor Ortiz, we like you to give a Hispanic Heritage Month presentation, but please don't talk about assimilation. Uh, do you think that's played out? As a cat? And I was like, oh my God, thank you. I don't have to explain why assimilation is a waste of time. Or I can give you the historiographical uh, explanation of, of how in immigration history, we talk about immigration, assimilation, Americaniz Americanism, and how that still blunts much of the things we're trying to do in, in US history. We're still very assimilationist, by the way. Even when we use diversity often, uh, too often implies that I can be diverse if I, if I agree with your kind of mainstream perspective of how you're framing the question. That's not really diversity. My students want to know, how do we shake things up? And so this is why in African American Latinx history, chapter one is on the Haitian Revolution. Chapter two is on the Mexican War of Independence. The argument here is that you have to go outside of the US to understand this nation's history. You either have to do what I did as a younger Special Forces soldier, or you have to do it with your imagination. When I was in Central America in the mid 80s, I got a lot of tough questions about the US that I wasn't ready to answer. And so I've spent years trying to answer those. Like, number one, like, what are you all doing down here? <laughs> I thought it was the... <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, freedom, yeah, exactly. And so, yeah, I mean, I think um, a lot of things, you know, have, have changed in history in the short time I've, I've been here. And I was talking to a couple of colleagues. Um, you know, I remember John Hope Franklin. Um, I was so, I've been so blessed in my career to be around these incredible people. But I remember John Hope's last few years at Duke and talking with him. Every time I could see him give a talk or a lecture or my students, because I was starting to teach that, I was like, we got you got to go there. That's it's required. It's not extra credit. You have to see Dr. Franklin. And John Hope got increasingly anguished about the state of this country. So much so that he was disturbing people around him. They were saying, well, John Hope used to be so hopeful, you know? And he's like, no. <laughs> This is not the time to be hopeful. And I think that's, that's the message I want to leave us with now is that we just have a lot of work to do. And we have to remember that when we're having these discussions, there are K through 12 teachers in states like Florida who cannot say anything about these topics. There may be a mandate in Florida for Af African-American history teaching, and we're grateful for that. But the reality is I have many former students who are teachers in Florida who tell me we can't say a word about black history that's really meaningful beyond just kind of a glossy kind of thing. 
So it's a struggle. That's the best I can do. It's a struggle. Thank you. <laughs> I have one great question for the panel, but I'm just going to hold it back because I, I want to. I want the audience to dive into this. This is incredibly rich. There are a lot of big problems raised here, maybe none of them solved. Just a careful one. Uh, so go for it. Let's get you the mic. I was just struck listening to this about, about format and where our students are right now. And, and I kept thinking that part of the solution to Florida and part of the solution to some of these others seems to be in need of, of transformation of, of pedagogy and how we teach it. But I keep envisioning this digital form of how we do this history where the students are invited to explore down separate paths rather than I'm going to take the African class or I'm going to take the Asian class or I'm going to reconceive sovereignty versus property rights that that we need to meet them where they are where it's almost a, a, and that the, the technology is different than the way we learn it's not just the textbook because what you're describing here is an unfinished masterwork like the, the history of Rome or the, the history of the British Empire that no one's going to read or no one's, is, they're all going to be intimidated to approach. And I, it's just the, the initial formation of an idea that I'm curious about. As you all do, rightfully, we're all here in agreement that we've got to demand a, a better solution to this, how that would look. And it's not the traditional textbook or the traditional sequence of courses. It's not tenable. It's a student-led exploration into who am I and what are my pieces to all of this. Just curious. You want to know what the unfinished master work will look like? It, and I, we have to, right? Because if you're sure, I guess. I mean, we, we, did, we did a lot of work on the on the African American and Hispanic curriculum. We, yeah, yeah. we were asked about it. We were asked about it. Yeah, we're asked, you know, why are you trying to trigger our kids, basically? And um, we had to go back through, and are we going to start? Yeah, yeah, I'm going to ask you some of it. Anyway. I'm a little worried about the student led just because it's, yeah, I, was um, I mean, <laughs> it's, you know, part of, it's not just about finding your history, I think it's also about understanding how, how relational all these histories are. I mean, like, in teaching African American history, one of the points I have to make to students who are looking for their past is that you don't really understand the construction of racial categories unless you understand what's happening to Native Americans in the various regions you're looking at the experience, the African American experience, and that, that, you know, that all these identities and these experiences are happening in relationship to each other, that there's issues of, as other people calls it, land labor indifference, that we're working in tandem. So I think it's hard for students to come in with a sense of why we need to like tell this inclusive history. I think we need to provide some guidance on that. Anyone else? Uh, student like uh, Master Merrick? <laughs> I was just going to say that it sounded like a choose your own adventure path. Yeah. Well, and or a web or something where you can, you can see they don't read. So <laughs> it seems like. Are you going to trust me? No, it has to be stupid. <laughs> um, it, it seems like where we are at right now is that there could be one textbook, one textbook as a foundation and then multiple paths that then come back to discuss together right in a in a relational way i cannot teach about citizenship and the asian american experience or really anything 
Without African American history, I can't talk about the labor experience of Asian immigrants in the plantation system without Native Hawaiian and indigenous history. We can't understand the ongoing legacy of detention on Angel Island without understanding the lack of asylum for Central American refugee and asylum seekers, right? You know, so the relational way. So if there was ample time, right, and ample resources, you could perhaps do both and. Um, but that's we're not we're not there yet. Well, and I, you know, oral history reminds us of that way. I just have to say this: uh, one textbook to rule them all. I know. I think that. I know. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I, 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 right. I know. Um, but I think that oral history's continuing promise is to be able to do some of this, like not all of it. I mean, we, we have to provide some guidance because. You know, a lot of times people will, will read our works and will say, we've heard this today many times, oh, I'm in college or in grad school, why didn't I know this kind of basic thing? And that's just reality. And even worse, in, in Florida, when I teach labor history, and we start the first day, and I, I ask, well, how many of you have heard of Franklin Delano Roosevelt? My students are like, yeah, we heard about him, and he's the one that caused the Great Depression. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's how they talk about Frank Roosevelt in the Deep South. Mother just rolled over. <laughs> so, but, but oral history, you know, asking our students in, in the oral history context, you know, finding out something about your family. Um, I think that we do have to start, I'm not pushing back against what, what Nick and Eric are saying, but I do, like, people ask me all the time in a different context as a labor organizer. As a person who works with social movements, people often ask me, how do, how do we get a coalition going with the people uh, in that different neighborhood? You know, And I often do start with, with the history question. I'll say, well, what, what, do you, what do you know about your neighborhood's history? Well, we, we know almost nothing. And I said, well, start there. Start with your histories, and then you can gain a sophistication about how your history interacts you know, the fourth ward of Houston interacts with the fifth war. Now that, that those are two very sort those are two most historical wars in the United States of America. We're talking about Mickey Leland, Barbara Jordan, mm -hmm. and this incredible history. And so if you're going to do something to learn about that those the histories of those wars, it can start with your people, but then you have to learn about the history of the other war. Right? What's the difference between the Bronx and the financial history? That's not a quiz, <laughs> but, but you all know that, that but, but again, I think we have to start, you know, we have to start, like you mentioned, we have to start where our students are or where they would like to be. Um, now, I didn't interview my own father until I was 40 years old. That's an embarrassment. I mean, I've been doing oral history my whole life. And the first thing my father told me was, well, you know, I met Fidel Castro. I said, are you serious? I mean, I knew my dad would recruit you. never told me? Yeah, and I said, you know, why didn't you ever tell me? Guess what he said? Yes. Thank you. My <laughs> <laughs> uh, Tom, you got one from Streaming World, or you want to keep going with the audience? Uh, yeah, I, let me. Uh, okay. uh, this is from uh, 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 Stuart Davenport, who has two related questions. One, what do the panelists think about the high ideals, mixed results narrative of U.S. history? And then the second, and related, is if I optimistically believe that the arc of the moral universe bends towards justice, does that mean that I hold a Whiggish view of American history? So I guess it's how do you kind of like like structure your 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 narrative? Eric, do you want that one? Well. Uh... Okay. Yeah, I, I, it's a good question. Um, I'm not one of those who uh, talks about the arc of the moral universe pointing toward justice. There's too much evidence to the contrary, especially uh, nowadays. As I said before, and I, I must, I must preface this by saying I, I really enjoyed all of the presentations. I think this was a very is a very. Uh, valuable uh, discussion going on here. Um, <laughs> excuse me, but um, 
it, to me, it's the struggle itself that is the story. Uh, whether you're talking about freedom, sovereignty, other ideas, settler colonial, it's the you know it's the conflict which is the dynamic pushing history forward. And I think if you think of it that way, um, you you can you can you can avoid a Whiggish view that progress is inevitable and that. Even though we've had problems in the past, we're sort of solving them all now. So uh, moving forward, um, you know, the, the, these the conflicts do not have a predetermined end, but they're a way of avoiding the the older textbook vision, which is just a kind of straight line toward greater and greater progress, greater and greater rights, which um, doesn't really seem very plausible today. That, that urge you say you'll take that under your breath. Uh, I, know, I, would, I would take a, a conflict rather than the theme of freedom. Again, this kind of, uh, which is kind of an earlier debate in US historiography, but a conflict versus consensus, which uh, many of us may have remembered from the late 80s or something. Um, I'll take uh, that kind of vision um, over some more. Um, Media is what we might call um, the nationalist uh, kind of celebratory vision of the centrality of the United States as the sole uh, exemplar. You know, um, actually, my book begins with the question how can a, um, a nation founded on the homeland of dispossessed indigenous people be the world's most exemplary democracy? But you think of democracy as, uh, as our theme without dispossession? Um, it's like thinking about freedom without slavery, right? So we've been able to think about freedom and slavery as the poor and so many other kind of advanced. We can't think of dispossession, colonialism, incarceration, removal um, as other central themes. And we may genocide a theme of American struggle <laughs> very huge. So uh, I'm not sure we're there yet. Um Sandra Powers uh, doesn't have one Native Americans and everyone's right to vote on. Right in the age of genocide is included a quite an embodiment indigenous genocide and uh, focused pretty heavily in my opinion on talking about the inability to see a different temporality of genocide and U.S. relationships with the other people. Um, those sort of volumes of the century of genocide, uh, the age of genocide, all of which located in the 20th century subject. So if we can't move uh, conceptually outside of our normative frames, we won't be able to deal with the students the teachers. And so it's our kind of imperative responsibility to be informed about this subject, we call American history. Um, and we then can hold one another accountable, at least in our public work, the kind of in our classrooms without the pedagogy and scholarship we do. Because the 14th Amendment does not apply to all Americans. Mm -hmm. The second founding of the eighth claim, virtually all Americans. Um, the Native Americans are excluded from the 14th century. And they are the 1866 Civil Rights Act. So if we can't understand the kind of political standing of the Native Americans within the United States from the founding through the Reconstruction era in the 19th and early 20th century, we may not understand the political of the United States division. So I don't know if that's um, like too critical of a perspective to advance, but it seems to me to be the right. You know, there are places in the world where this question of progress and where the arc is going don't really get ends. I mean, everyone wants to believe in progress and doesn't want to wake up in the morning and get better or something. But there's something peculiarly American about the constancy of our expectation that history must be going someplace. The place. American progress. Yeah. Uh, so I, I don't know. You know, I always I push this with students. Uh, is she going somewhere? <laughs> yes, sir. Um, so so I would I would make a plea. This is sort of similar to my earlier question today. Is that you all put your big brains together and churn out yes. churn out that unified narrative of American history because um, we are not knowledgeable or skilled enough about every single one of these areas in order to bring to bear 
uh, that knowledge for our students. And so if that unified narrative is not there, if the textbook excludes this group or that group, uh, then they may get excluded, especially because there is this big movement again in education towards inquiry-based education, which says the kids get to choose what they want to study. And if that's the case, they may learn a lot about something very specific, maybe their own history, but they're not going to learn all of these amazing things that you all have talked about that have been ignored for, for decades. It's very good point. You put your finger on the problem of teaching everything. I don't want to do all of you. Yeah, I used to be a teacher. <laughs> <laughs> Even I looked at the time I was doing it, could have been. My mom was a high school teacher for over 40 years. And she tells me every day, what you do is me. My uncle just, in Flint, used to say, you teach in any more than two days a week. <laughs> you do it all year. Question back to the yes, yes, ma'am. Right How about who's got the mic? Um, go for it. There's two of us. Do you want to go first, or should I? Um, I'll go first. <laughs> <laughs> give me a choice, <laughs> and I'll give you you the choice. I have two unrelated questions. Um, one is it desirable to have a unified narrative of pluralistic, pluralistic America? And second, where do you see? Exactly. Where do you see the landscape and environment fitting into our conception of American history? Well, I, you know, I don't think, I guess the answer changes over time. I mean, we reference who built America by the, the American Social History Project, and that, that endeavor obviously was heavily influenced by the work of Professor Boner. And people like Kurt Gutman, Dan Litwack, and Nancy Hewitt, and generations of incredible labor historians. I think that I love it. You know, that, that's the first textbook I use teaching the U.S. History Survey because it asks that question that you know, growing up as a working class kid, you always ask, which was, who's going to do the work? And, and that's the question that middle class and upper class people all, all, often don't have to, to grapple with. But at the same time, when we look at who built America, there are silences. So if you base a text on the idea of labor as the source of all wealth, what about settler colonialism? Um, and so what about the environment? Again, if labor is the source of all wealth, and, and that's obviously a venerable idea that predates Karl Marx by several centuries, actually. Um, it, it, it provides a lot, but then it misses Things. And it's interesting for me because right now, actually, I've been asked to write the epilogue for the latest edition of Google America. And so I'm grappling with this question. I think they could like five thousand words or something for a certain tiny little thing. But so, but yeah, the environment is missing. What are we doing? That's a huge field, man. Huge field. We have a joke in the history department, you know, all you're not doing environmental history because it seems like everybody is. Except you and me. Uh, we didn't answer the is it necessary to do by history? Well, let's move to the next question. Okay, up here. Up here. The, the audience has seized the microphone. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'll surrender it to you. Ripped it away from me. No, I'm, I'm um, my name is Haley. I teach high school in Southwest Florida, specifically American history. Um, well, and the school district that I work for is currently kowtowing is the best way I can put it to the parental rights movement and my administrators are um, very conservative and have been kind of keeping watch on what we've been teaching in our classrooms. And I work with colleagues who are really passionate about teaching U.S. history in a way that is diverse and inclusive, but it seems that at every turn our hands are tied, we're being observed, um, and we're just tired. And the attempts that we are allowed to make at teaching diverse um, curricula, at best it feels like we're just tokenizing American history. Um, and so I guess my question is, 
do you have any suggestions for how to work within that kind of system or is that even possible? Makes me want to leave. You need political advice as well as history advice. Uh, did they know you're here? Uh, well, I, no, I didn't tell anyone. They knew I was out of work, but I didn't tell anyone why. Uh, okay. <laughs> you know, one of the things is, is why well, I don't. Yeah, I mean, because I, you know, you and I spoke earlier, and some of my former students were just incredible teachers in Miami Day and Broward and left. I mean, they left from California or New York. Or, that's the idea. Yeah, that's the idea is to destroy. I mean, I think one of the things is not to quit. Yeah, okay. think, so one of the things you have to be candid with each other about is there's a plan to destroy public education. Yeah, yeah. And it's very well advanced. And I think it gets back to something David said earlier, or actually all of us said earlier at a certain point. The problem we have, the biggest political mistake my generation made was to assume that certain things were given and have been solved. Roe v. Wade, the Voting Rights Act, the right to collective bargaining. I would line up to see all three of those things just destroyed, just undermined. And again, and we thought states' rights was undermined. Yeah, we thought, you know, exactly. This month, the Supreme Court's going to, yeah. I mean, I think so, and that's kind of a long way of getting back to saying that I think we have to go on the offensive again. And in every Florida school district, as you know, there are groups of, of parents who are very well funded that go to school district meetings to just jack things up, right? And they attack teachers, and their goal is to destroy public education. So we have to get beyond the notion that we're kind of all in this together, right? And see, if you're in Florida and you, see, you come out with, oh, we're all in this together, and there's the, there's the cultural left and cultural right, people look at you like, what are you talking about? That, that, those terms don't even mean anything when you say Florida. What matters is defending teachers. What matters is defending the right for our students to read Toni Morrison and Alice Walker and James Baldwin and Rudolfo Anaya, all authors that have been heavily banned in Sunshine State. That's what matters. And so, yeah, I would just, what, 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 what we can do here is to be your allies and to be with you. And what parents need to do is if they're disturbed by this, I mean, and parents are already doing this all throughout the, the country. They're, they're holding, um, I was just interviewed about this, parents are beginning to hold banned book clubs, okay? And they'll invite the media and they'll say, oh, my district banned Kurt Vonnegut's Slaughterhouse Fine. And so that's the book we're going to read this, this month. And does our local, you know, local media want to come and actually learn about this book? And not just the salacious parts about sex that are in Richard Wright's name son, but read the whole thing. And so, in other words, it's going on the offensive, but, but being there, that whole great you know, concept in German philosophy is really central to what we need to do. We need to be with you um, as fellow educators. Maybe we're not teachers, but we're still educators. <laughs> no, I'm still a teacher. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, most of uh, I just wanted to say to the question, do is it, is it even necessary to have a unified sort of uh, One sentence answer to that is yes, it is, because if you don't write it or we don't write it, a lot of other people already are. So abandon it, abandon it at your risk. In fact, they're not only like writing it, they're telling you. Can we take another one back to Martha? Oh, no, right here, right here. Okay. All right. Um, I just want to appreciate so much each of your presentations and that each of you have written like a truly definitive text that um, has changed the landscape of each of the fields that you're working in. So I just want to express that appreciation. Um, and so my question is connected to this idea of how you think of yourselves as stewards of these histories. Um, right, like holding a lot of nuance that, and I appreciate um, like Dr. Ortiz Paul's point of, you know, like all of the different shoulders and little scholars and organizers and historians whose work you're 
all of yours sits on, as well as the familial cultural histories. Um, but that ultimately, both given the you know horrific state of like racial and ethnic diversity in even within faculty of higher education, like you all are some of the onlys, and also the stewards of you know writing these histories. Um, and so I work in a graduate school, and one of the other aspects of this is that not only do you know folks in their 30s, 40s, or even 50s come to graduate school and say, how did I never learn about any of this? The emphasis in most, outside of the faculty of the arts, in most um, practitioner graduate schools is to create the next best thing, like the next startup and like the next sexiest idea to not only kind of fit your own meritocracy narrative of like, how do I get to the next kind of achievement, but also because, um, you know, that's the kind of, uh, that's like the direction we should be going, not, not looking back to history. So I'm saying all of that to say, well, like the emphasis is really disturbing in the environment I'm in on, like, how do you create your own individual start up your own individual narrative resume, et cetera, et cetera. Each of you are individually these incredible stewards of history. And so I'm curious how you think about, um, you know, that how you think about your work in relationship to museums and to all of the oral history and ancestral, you know, contributions we've talked about, but just as stewards, like how do you, how do you sleep at night? <laughs> how do you kind of, um, you know, think about the weight of, you know, the documentation initiatives that each of you are doing. Uh, Lawrence O'Donnell put me to sleep. <laughs> anyway, uh, stewards. Are we stewards of this? Um, I think we are in certain ways. One thing I thought about in relationship to textbook writing is it's a very distinctive kind of writing. It's not yeah. the most glamorous. It's not the most eloquent. It's hard. It's hard, but but what I see as your responsibility as a textbook writer is actually to represent the state of it's the sort of state of the field knowledge generally accepted kind of you know you interpretations change and part of what you do when you update a textbook is you like there's been all this interesting work on this and we're really beginning to think of it a different way. So um, it's careful work, and I, I think it speaks to the, why we, like David was saying, we do we do need a sort of broad inclusive history because we need commonly accepted facts. We need we need to we need to sort of rally people around, you know, actually incorporating what we know, um, and which is why I think a lot of us also do public history work. It's just like whatever whatever we can do to get the sort of cutting edge knowledge out there. Yeah, I was just gonna, as you were finishing your, your question, I was thinking to myself, oh, I hope this is heading towards the, um, the work that we all can do or the importance of historic science museums, historical societies, et cetera. So thank you for asking the question. Um, I, I, before I before I offer some thoughts on that, I did want to I offer a realization, which is there is a cost to um, to the ongoing sort of spinning of wheels that I feel that many of us have talked about in terms of the growth of the field. So when we have to keep on an answering the basic questions or filling in the basic gaps that prevents us from moving on to the next set of questions, the deeper set of, of research problems um, that have societal impact. Because we're constantly asking or answering the question, why did the Chinese get excluded or something? You know, um, Or why is Chinese New Year really not the most appropriate way to teach Asian American history? Um, so th th that's that's frustrating because we all have been in this field for about the same amount of time. I'm not going to say how many decades, but, but there's a couple of generations. Don't, don't talk decades. <laughs> there's a couple of generations in documentary film, in, as well as monographs, that are now in the public sphere. Um, so it's not just the fault of academic historians. I mean, there, there's a gap because my students still have very little basic understanding of the field that I specialize in when they came right back to um, this is this is why you know so we're focusing on what's happening in K-12 classrooms it's the front lines I also think that our historic sites 
or another kind of front line for a whole different set of of, um, of the American populace. And I want to share a an example of incremental change that I, I've been privileged to see over a couple of decades. I started volunteering at the Angel Island Immigration Station Foundation as a graduate student. It was before it was a National Historic Landmark. You had to wear a hard hat because it was uh, the buildings were close to being demolished. It was not safe to be there, yet we were giving tours. Um, I was part of a group of volunteers that then helped to make that immigration station a National Historic Landmark. Federal funding, Save America's Treasures, you know, all now tens of thousands of California school children get to, to get to go there. Um, part of my scholarship and that of many others helped to do the exhibits, write a book, uh, you know, other things. Um, I was able to visit there just last month. Uh, there's a new museum that was just opened up, and I was talking to the longtime park ranger. Uh, and just we were just chatting. What was the, you know what was the early part of the pandemic like? Blah blah. She's like, I'll tell you what happened. You know, first of all, we were able to pivot to remote kind of learning really quickly because we've been doing that before. But the other thing was that after George Floyd, we were the ones leading the rest of our colleagues in the California State Park System in terms of how to teach about race because. We have been doing it already for decades because you had to. You can't understand this experience and the detention barracks and the exclusion laws without race and racism. And so we were ready. We were ready. We were eight. We were. We were. You know. We had the tools. And many of our other partners, including the folks just down the hill who who um, steward the civil war site. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So that's sort of like an incremental change. Let's do what we can. <laughs> and not that the, the universe will arc towards justice, but it does can pay it forward. Real quickly, um, several of these questions kind of have reminded me of uh, the value, incredible value that teaching brings that many of us across institutions and across uh, school audiences are all engaged in. And I work with teachers of various capacities and with my students, and I see a few here in the audience um, who may remember the imperatives that I provide around even the most basic forms of analysis and self-expression. And I think history provides that kind of uh, heuristic and kind of in, uh, form of social uh, engagement. They were all doing it on some level. And we do it think, really well um, in all kinds of ways, whether it be in the KP system or for public uh, museums and audiences or in our scholarship. And I have a particular penchant for the active voice rather than the pensive. I have a particular penchant against prepositional phrases. I have certain things that I really care about, but I know others do as well. And I learned them in the K through 12 system. So, like, there's a certain kind of beauty that I think history provides in certain types of pedagogical ways as well that I think might be a unifying uh, form of um, engagement that many of us are all in. Uh, that took years to go to the passive voice. Uh, can we take one more from Martha? So, you know, yeah. And Michelle is telling me to call cancel this. Call this, this, this will be quick. Thank oh, you. Sorry. Thank you so much. I'll try to avoid the prepositional phrase. Um, <laughs> this morning, a few times I, and throughout the day, I've heard uh, this history that we're all talking about is divisive history. And I think that is uh, very opportunistic for the right wing and the parents' rights movement and so forth. That's the point, right, of teaching this history. So I wonder um, if, if you think calling this unifying history has any traction. Thank you. Wow. Can we take that to coffee with us and, and awesome. ask everybody uh, to come back with an answer from the coffee break? I mean, that's actually, yeah. In fact, add to that, add to that, folks. What about the dark stuff? How do you teach it? You got a formula? 
Because if you do, package it up. So you can get a patent on it. Because we got to do it, but how do you do it? Um, you know, Baldwin has come up over and over and over. One of my favorite lines from Baldwin in 1962 is when he said the trouble with history in America is they use it to cover up the sleeper, but not to wake him up. You know, we love the history, but to sleep at night. But we, we don't like the stuff. I don't know about the sleep. So I don't know, maybe sleep. No, that's not a good metaphor for 3 30 in the afternoon. All right, right just pop me up stick. Hey, Eric, thank you. Come on, brother. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Get some coffee. We'll be right back here.